Good morning, everybody. Um, and I want to say thank you, too, for just your faithful, consistent, sacrificial giving to City Life, to Kingdom Builders, to all that God's called us to do. And it's cool to know that we're making an impact not only here in Philly, what we can see and touch, but all over the world. We have more than 40 missionaries and organizations that your giving every month helps us to support as a church. And so thank you for being a part of that. Hey, if I haven't met you yet, my name's Brad. I'm the lead pastor here, and I'm so happy that you're joining us today. Everybody online, welcome to our online campus. Welcome to our church. As we're continuing a series we're calling Next Door, we're talking about the art of neighboring. You know, one of the things I love about Philadelphia and I think is really uh, special about our city is the influence that Philly has all over the world when it comes to health care. And when it comes to the medical community, of course, uh, our nation's first hospital was started right here in Philadelphia. And we have one of the most effective children's hospitals anywhere in the world, CHOP, that's right here in Philly. And all of the medical students and nurses and doctors even that come to our city to train for a season, and uh, many of you even watch our services online, you were a part of City Life while you were here for medical school, and you're in other parts of the country or the world. It's amazing to have that kind of impact as a city um, in, this, uh, in this arena. And I think we've seen over the last year how frontline, you know, how critical uh, medical and healthcare professionals are to our everyday lives. And so nurses and doctors and EMTs, and uh, I think it'd be cool. Why don't we just even, let's put our hands together and just appreciate, can we, all of the healthcare workers I um, was talking to one of our Dream Team members this morning who works in billing for anesthesiology at Pennsylvania, and so even all of the administrative staff that makes it all work, thank you. And I think it's interesting to think about where even uh, healthcare came from, the systems that we have today, hospitals, where all of that originated. And you know, one of, the, uh, one of the things that really caused the early church to skyrocket in growth over the second and third centuries, it was, believe it or not, two pandemics that came into the Roman Empire. One uh, during the leadership of Augustine, and then, and then the Cyprian pandemic was the other one. One was measles, one was smallpox. And when the measles and smallpox plagues came into the Roman Empire, people just started fleeing the cities. Millions of people were just trying to get out of the cities. And when that happened, those who were moving in were the Christians. They started moving in so that they could do something that really hadn't been done before, and that was something called nursing, so that they could simply care for people who were dying. And they began moving in to care for the sick, to care for the dying at a time that everybody else was trying to just get out because it was so contagious, these epidemics. And as they began to care for people, uh, Rodney Stark, he's a sociologist, a historian, he says that if you were to catch one of these viruses in the Roman Empire, there was a 30% mortality rate. Think about that. I think in the United States at least, uh, out of maybe 32 million cases or so we've had of COVID, just over 500,000 deaths, so it's less than 2%, and that's assuming that all of the cases have been reported. And so think about a 30% mortality rate that was there, but what Rodney Stark says is that if somebody who was sick received even the most basic care, something as simple as someone who would give them food and water, that, that mortality rate would go from 30% to 10%. And so what happened over the course of time of these epidemics is that uh, the population percentage of Christians skyrocketed. One, because there was a lower mortality rate in the church than there was in the general population because Christians were caring for one another. And then two, because many uh, non-Christians, once they got better, owed their lives to Christians who put their own lives on the line to take care of them. And so there was an amazing thing that took place. And what happened was because Christians and the church were practicing hospitality, something new came into civilization called hospitals. And anywhere you go today, you know, Healthcare was at least one third of Jesus' ministry. He came into a village and he preached and he taught and he healed the sick. And so Christians have always been about teaching and healthcare. And so anywhere you go in the world, 
the, the first school, the first institution of higher learning, and the first hospital in a country were always started by missionaries, every, every, anywhere you go. And so when you begin to see this, I, I think the question is, why is this kind of practical ministry such a natural outgrowth of Christianity? And that's what we want to look at today as we continue this series next door. Now, I, uh, uh, one of the reasons that we're in this series, because we have a focus this year as a church, and that is what we're calling seven days a week on mission. <laughs> We've learned over the last year that Sundays alone are not enough to fulfill the mission of Jesus. And so we want to know how can we on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, practically in our everyday lives, carry out the mission of Jesus. And this series, we're just getting practical. What does it look like to love our neighbors as we love ourselves? And so I want to take you to John 13 and a really dramatic moment in the life of Jesus just hours before his crucifixion. He was seated at a Last Supper with his disciples They were having uh, the Passover meal, and as they came to really the heart of the meal, Jesus held up the bread and he said, from here on out when you eat this bread, you're not just looking backward to the Exodus and how God delivered you from Egypt, you're now remembering me and what I'm about to do for you, my body. Then Jesus held up the wine and he said whenever you drink now from the cup you're going to remember not just the spilled blood of a lamb at the exodus and passover but you're going to remember my blood that's going to be shed for you as well and then jesus in the midst of this scene i want you just to try to picture it they're all sit- sitting there you know leonardo da vinci he's in the corner painting it and jesus says this in john 13 verse 34 a new commandment I give to you. I want to pause here just for a minute. A new commandment I give to you. Now for the disciples to hear this, it would have felt really overwhelming because they had a lot of commandments already. In fact, the Pharisees were, uh, they were enraptured with the law. And in the Hebrew language, the Ten Commandments had 613 letters. And so what the religious leaders did down through the centuries in Judaism is in the Talmud, which was their extra-biblical source, they had developed a list of 613 laws in honor of the 613 letters that existed in the Ten Commandments. So you had these 613 laws. Imagine how hard it would be to even memorize them, to even know what they are, let alone obey them all and fulfill them all. And so now Jesus is saying to them, hey, guys, I got a new one. I got another one. But this new commandment is going to be unlike any of the other commandments. In in other words, in fact, this new commandment is not just going to be an addendum to tack on the end of the other commandments. This new commandment is not going to be number 614 in the list. This new commandment is actually going to fulfill all of the other commandments. This new commandment is going to summarize all of the other commandments. And if you will be able to give yourself passionately to this new commandment and align your lives around this new commandment, you will end up in the end fulfilling all of the other 613 of them. And so here he says, a new commandment I give to you, and here it is, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. So this new commandment that is going to fulfill all of the other commandments that you have spent your life trying to obey is simply this, this is love, to love one another. That's the new commandment, like I have loved you. And picture again, Jesus is setting the example for them right here here at this meal. He's there and he's at the table and even though there are two of his closest friends there, Peter and Judas, who are going to betray him in a matter of hours, Jesus is washing their feet. And he's showing all of us that here's what the new commandment is. It's going to look like love, which is getting your hands a little messy. It's getting your hands dirty. It's getting a little lower. It's humbling yourself. It's pulling back your pride to risk maybe even rejection or betrayal to in practical ways. Now you are going to love one another. This is the new commandment that I am giving you. As Paul would later write in 1 Corinthians 13, love is patient, love is kind. This is the way that we're going to relate to one another. Love doesn't boast. It doesn't keep track of the sins of others. It rejoices with the truth. This is the new commandment. Love. 
one another as I've loved you. He sets the bar. And then he says this in verse 35. By this, all people will know that you're my disciples by the way you vote. No. By your theology. No. If you build large and powerful organizations. No. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you have love for one another. If you've ever wondered what is the brand of Christianity. What is Christianity's trademark? This, at least in the heart of Jesus, in the intention of Jesus, is what it would be. That we would love one another, and that's how the world would peg you as a disciple of Jesus, by your love. This is how they'll know, because you love one another. I heard an interview with Pastor Rick Warren this past week that really challenged me, and he was sharing the story of his son Matthew, who they lost a few years ago to death by suicide. Matthew, who had dealt with mental illness since the time he was a little child. And he ended up taking his life. And Rick Warren, who of course is very well known and wrote The Purpose Driven Life, one of the most best-selling books of all time outside of the Bible, he said that in the weeks following Matthew's suicide, he received 35,000 cards from people who were just writing to wish him well. And what he said in the interview was that out of 35,000 cards, the ones that meant the most to him were not the ones from rock stars, although he got those, or from prime ministers, although he got those. He said, the ones that meant the most to me were from people who my son Matthew had loved to Jesus. That's the phrase he used. Because Matthew used to go on to um, suicide forums online. And he would, he would connect to other people who were living just in the darkness of mental illness, and he would talk them out of suicide. And out of his own pain, he would share his faith in Christ with others, and there were all of these people that had actually been loved to Jesus. I love that phrase. By Matthew, out of his own pain and out of his own sickness. And I, I heard that, and I thought, man, who am I in my life right now loving to Jesus? It made me think of... Uh, Ruth Valco, she always ends every text with that. She says, love you to Jesus. Love you to Jesus. And that's what Jesus said. This is what's going to set you apart. Now, we call this the ethic of Christ. It's the ultimate kingdom value. The new commandment that Jesus gave us to mark the new covenant we have with him. That you're going to love one another. And the Apostle Paul, who now would write a huge portion of the New Testament... He picked up on this ethic of Christ, and all over the place in his letters, he unpacks the new commandment that Jesus gave to us. And I want to show you three examples briefly of them, because I want you to see how the Apostle Paul now is going to pass this on to future generations, including us today. So we're going to look at a few verses from Romans 13, 1 Corinthians 9, and then Galatians 6, and that's where we'll close. Uh, Romans 13, let's go to this one first, and we're going to pick it up in verse 8. Here's how Paul puts this into words. Owe no one anything except to love each other, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. Now, again, those that he was writing to here, good Jews, they would never have dreamed in their lives that the law was something they could fulfill. I mean, how do you get 613 out of 613? You can't. But here Paul is saying there is a way to fulfill the law, and that is by loving one another. And here's what he says, verse 9. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And any other commandment are summed up in this word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And he quotes Jesus, and what Jesus says is the greatest commandment. And here's why, verse 10. Love does no wrong to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling of the law. And so he's listing the Ten Commandments here. Don't steal, don't kill, don't commit adultery, don't covet. And what he says is that the heart of the Ten Commandments is loving one another. And the reason that the Ten Commandments have for generations served so cross-culturally and so transgenerationally, and the reason they're so foundational to any healthy society is because to break one of the Ten Commandments is extremely unloving. It's an unloving thing to do, to commit adultery, to steal, to murder, even to covet. You say, well, what about that one? 
when we are jealous of one another, what happens is that jealousy tears away at a relationship. Because if I'm jealous of something that you have, that prohibits me from rejoicing with you. And that becomes, my jealousy, the lid on how far our relationship is going to be able to go in true intimacy. If I can't celebrate you, then I become your competitor. And the only way for me to rise is for you to be lowered down. And so all of these, it's unloving. And that's why he says, love does no wrong to a neighbor. And so if you want to fulfill the law, love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so Paul, what he's going to do, and we're going to look at the other two examples now, in his letters is he coins this little phrase that for him becomes the shorthand for uh, taking us back to the Last Supper with Jesus and internalizing the new commandment from Christ. And it's a little phrase that for Paul is the law of Christ. Anytime you see that in one of his epistles, you can pause and know he's talking about Jesus at the Last Supper and the new commandment. The law of Christ. And so let me show you just two of them briefly this morning. 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. He says, For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. I love this verse, Paul's passion. You know, he says, Man, I've wasted so much time doing so much damage. I'm making up for lost time, and I'm going to do anything short of sinning to reach people, to love people to Jesus, to win people to Jesus. And so he says, what he's going to say now is that he's going to talk about two groups of people, those under the law and those that are outside the law. Let's look at it, verse 20. To the Jews, here's the first group, I became as a Jew in order to win Jews. To those under the law, I became as one under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. How many times can you say under the law in one sentence? He's going to do it. But what he's saying is that to the Jewish community, those who grew up under the 613 commandments, those who are under the Torah, he says, I'll get in that world. And even though there are laws that no longer apply to me as a follower of Jesus, and even though there are cultural things that I'm not bound to follow, I will voluntarily accept them so that I can build a bridge to others in that community that I want to serve and love to Jesus. And so he says, I make myself their servant. I bring myself under the law even though I am not under the law anymore. Now, here's what he says in verse 21. Watch this. To those outside the law. Now he's talking about Gentiles, those who didn't grow up under that tradition. He says, I became as one outside the law. Not being outside the law of God, but under, and here's our phrase, the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. So here's where it gets a little on the surface confusing, because in verse 20 he says, I'm not under the law. But now in verse 21 he says, I am under the law. But what's the law that he's under? The law of Christ, which is what? The new commandment that Jesus has given us in the new covenant, which is to love one another as Jesus has loved us, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And so what he's saying is that love commands me to do it. And do you see what's happening here is that love actually raises the bar much, much higher. He says that I'm not bound anymore because of Christ to these Jewish traditions, but love commands me to put myself under them so that I can love fellow Jews well. And then he says to Gentiles, what am I going to do? Well, I'm going to set aside some of my cultural traditions that I grew up with in order to sit down and share a meal with them and connect with them. That's what love commands me to do, to sacrifice my own traditions, to sacrifice my own preferences. Love commands me to do it, to be seated at the table with them. Love is going to always raise the stakes and the expectations higher than any other law ever would do. It's the law of Christ. The law of Christ. Love one another as I've loved you. And I'll show you one more in Galatians chapter 6. And this is where I think we can make it really practical. And we'll camp out here as we, uh, as we close this today. Galatians chapter 6, verse 2. We see this little phrase again, but I want you to, I want you to see what he says here. Bear one another's burdens... And so fulfill 
the law of Christ. Do you want to fulfill the law? You want to live the life that God's called you to live? Life of obedience to the Lord, a life that truly fulfills the law of God. Here it is. Bear one another's burdens. Bear one another's burdens. And when you do that, you fulfill. We're not talking about 613 rules and regulations. You fulfill the law of Christ. The heart of Christ. You walk truly in the example of Christ. In the footsteps of Christ. Bear one another. Bear one another's burdens. And that's how you fulfill the law of Christ. Now I want to I want to pause for a moment and we're going to memorize this verse today. All right, everybody? You came to church on a rainy Sunday morning. You're online. You did it. You got out of bed. You pushed yourself. You're here. And so we're going to go the extra mile. We're going to memorize a Bible verse today. You ready? Let's, let's look at it and let's say it out loud together. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Can you go ahead and put it back up there? As I want us to say, all right? You guys ready? Say it with me. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. All right, we're going to do this kids' ministry style, okay? Everybody's in City, City Life Kids today. Go ahead and put up the next one. You ready? Here we go. Bear one another's and so the law of Christ. All right, here we go. We're make it a little harder. Put up the next one. Bear, good job, one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. One more time, we're going to raise the stakes without any help. Go ahead and take it off. You guys ready? You can do it. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. Give yourselves a hand. Online, way to go. Give yourself some hearts online. Bear one another's burdens. Here's what, here's what this means. You see somebody who's weighted down because of a situation financially. I'm going to share that burden. See somebody who's, you know, struggling to take care of maybe kids working two jobs and the practical demands, online, virtual school, there's something I can do. I'm going to share that burden. See somebody carrying a burden maybe because of their past mistakes, situations from their past. I'm going to get in there. How can I share that burden? That's what we're talking about. You see somebody carrying a burden because of some sickness that they're going through. They just were diagnosed with COVID or maybe there's an autoimmune disorder that that is there or something that's just, you're going to get in there. What does it look like to share that burden with them? Here's what it means to fulfill the law of Christ. When you identify the needs of others and share them as your own, you fulfill the law of Christ. When you identify what somebody else is going through, you say, I'm going to view that problem not as theirs to carry, but as if I was going through it myself. What did Jesus say? He gave us the caveat for what the new commandment looks like. Love each other as I have loved you. And this is what Jesus did, right? Because Jesus didn't need the cross. What did Jesus come to do? The greatest burden that we carry in life is our sin. And we don't always... We don't always realize that, but God knew that, that sin and our rebellion to him is the rot at the core of every other breakdown in our lives. And so Jesus came not to just judge our sin or investigate our sin or evaluate our sin. He came to carry it. And he went to the cross, and on one hand, Jesus did not need the cross. He didn't need to do it because he was sinless. He was perfect. There was nothing that he needed to happen there. But on the other hand, he did need to do it. Why? Because love commanded him to do it. Love commanded him to do it. And Jesus went to the cross, not because he needed it, but because you needed it, and because I needed it. And he shouldered our sin, and he carried our sin, and he took the burden and the weight that crushes us on his own shoulders, and he was crushed by it. And now he says to us, Go and do the same. Love others like I loved you. And when you and I identify the needs of others and share them as if they were our own, we pick up our own cross. We follow Jesus. And we fulfill the law of Christ. So I want to just give you, as we wrap this up, I think three practical expressions of this great command (laughs) 
bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And here's the first one. See other people's pain. That's where it starts. We've got to be able to see beyond what we're going through ourselves and see the pain that's around us. There's no shortage of opportunities. If you begin to look around you, do you know someone who's dealing with an addiction right now? Maybe a gambling addiction or an alcohol addiction. Do you know someone who's going through a divorce? Maybe there's someone in your life group, somebody on your street, a single dad, a single mom who's now splitting time with the kids or picking up an extra job because they're trying to take care of everything now on one paycheck or two paychecks. There's a burden that's there. What would it look like to say, how's it going? How can I lighten your load? Who could you see that's elderly, that maybe is isolated right now, that's inside, that can't really get out, that can't really interact with others around them? You could just say, you know what, once a week I'm going to check in on that neighbor. Once a week I'm going to check in on that person and just make sure they have what they need. Do you know someone who is in a sexual minority, who's in the LGBTQ community, that you could look and say, you know, there's a story, and here's a person, and what are the needs, and what are the pain, and is there a way that I could come into your world and help lighten the load that you're carrying? Do you know any children who have been stuck online at virtual school for the past year? (laughs) It's hard to quantify, isn't it, what's happening in the hearts and minds of little kids right now and what would it look like to come and to see them as a real person who's being shaped by this experience in real ways do you know someone who maybe lost a loved one over the last six months over the last 12 months that you could say you know what six months 12 months after losing a loved one that's when oftentimes people are forgetting about it to say well I'm not going to forget That I'm going to come in, I'm going to say, how's it going? How are you doing carrying the weight emotionally, practically of losing someone? Is there something I could do to lighten the load? Do you know someone who has a disability? Maybe a family with kids who have special needs. Maybe uh, someone from a different race, from a different socioeconomic background than you that you could come out and find find out, hey, what, what are the, what's the burden? What's the weight that you're carrying and how might I be able to share it with you? If we're going to fulfill the law of Christ, that's where it starts. We have to see the pain around us. And then number two is to get closer to others. To get closer to the weight. Because to bear one another's burdens, what does that imply? That you're walking shoulder to shoulder with somebody. I mean, you can't share a burden with somebody if there's distance between you and them. There's got to be proximity. That shoulder to shoulder, we're with people. And we're shouldering and sharing and carrying the weight. You know, I think one of the things that I, that I really honestly worry about right now, for the last year, what's the conditioning that we've been going through as a people, as a society? I think that social distancing was such an unfortunate phrase, honestly, in my opinion. Because what we have needed certainly for a season is physical distancing from one another. But more than ever before, we need proximity to one another, emotionally, relationally, socially. And it's very difficult to do something physically for a year without it also influencing what you're doing emotionally with others. I actually found myself the other day, I was talking to a friend, and I didn't notice this. He asked me about it. We were talking for three or four minutes. Every time he took a step toward me, I took a step away. And we literally moved like I don't know, five feet (laughs) to the side because it was just like, it's just like this conditioning that is just kind of in us now, right? And somehow we've got to figure out how do we get closer to one another? It's huge. If we're going to share one another's burdens, that's that's where it starts. And then the last one is to accept the weight of love. So how do I know if I'm fulfilling the law of Christ? Well, You know you're not carrying someone else's burden if you're not burdened at all. Is your life too comfortable? When's the last time your schedule was inconvenienced? Because you were just practically helping someone else do something that had no benefit to you yourself. What does it look like for your budget to be inconvenienced? 
See, fulfilling the law of Christ does not lower the stakes. It doesn't make this easier. It simplifies it, but this is an extremely inconvenient way to live, to bear one another's burdens. And that's why I want to leave you with this last just piece of encouragement. I think this can feel a little overwhelming because it's like even that list I read a minute ago, it's like, oh my word, like, do I have enough time in the day? Do I have enough <laughs> money in the bank? Like, how am I going to do that? And here's what I want you to know. We're not commanded to take other people's burdens. They're still carrying it. It's just that you're carrying it with them. And I love here in the same chapter, Galatians 2, verse 6 says, as you have opportunity, do good to others, especially those in the household of faith. So the question is, where's the opportunity? You can't, you're not going to fix all the problems in the world. You're not going to be able to fix all the problems that the people around you are dealing with. And the good news is that we're not called to fix them anyways. Just carry them. <laughs> Share them. But so where, where's the opportunity that God's putting in front of you this week? And here's the encouragement that all of this, it, it can't happen without the love of Christ, the power of Christ, the strength of Christ in you day in, day out. So I want to just leave you with this last verse, Matthew 11. These are the words of Jesus himself. I'm going to go ahead and put that up. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear. And look at this. The burden I give you is light. Because you're receiving the love of Christ, the power of Christ, the strength of Christ. You can give it away to others. Share their burdens. Carry their burdens. And here's what I want you to know. If you're here today and you feel heavy and you feel like you're carrying a burden, Jesus himself wants to take that burden from you. Come alongside of you. Share the weight of it with you, even now. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love that Jesus, you gave us this new commandment that's so radical and you showed us the way and you love us like this which is the only way we can love others like this and so right now I pray that your love would fill this room that each person who's experiencing this message would sense it, would feel it, would experience it and that as we do we would be raised up as an army of those who could go love our city to Jesus fulfill the law of Christ in Jesus name Amen just with your heads bowed and your eyes still closed here and online I just want to ask you a question where are you at with the Lord today because if you're here maybe the reality is that you're not walking in a relationship with God and I hope that what you can sense coming through this message is the heartbeat of Jesus and what Jesus has done to love you personally that he went to the cross to take care of what you would never be able to take care of on your own that he went to the cross laid down his life so that he could give you new life. And if you're here today and things are not right between you and God, I want to just give you an opportunity right now to put your faith in Jesus. I'm going to pray a prayer and lead us in a prayer. We're all going to pray it together. But if you know this is a choice you need to make, I'm going to invite you to just pray this prayer with me. Just say the words out loud. You don't have to shout them. Even if it's a whisper, just say them out loud from your heart. And God's here to meet you today. I really believe that. Let's pray together. Say, Jesus... I need you in my life. I can't be a good person without you. I can't figure out my future without you. I recognize I need you to be a savior. I believe you died in my place. I believe you rose from the dead. Now change my life from the inside out. 